Hello and welcome back to Principles of Macroeconomics. I am still your host, Dr. B, and we are still talking about aggregate demand. This time we're only talking about aggregate demand. I want to talk about the influence from monetary and fiscal policy. Monetary policy, as you recall from a few weeks ago, eh, a lot of weeks ago, so when we talked about monetary policy is that monetary policy and fiscal policy have to do a lot with interest rates, government bureaucracies, uh, and a lot of other influences on our monetary system, like the supply of money, like uh, the, the uh, interest rates, both real and uh, nominal. Those type of things have impacts on demand, as you might expect. When we have high interest rates at times of inflation, we know that the demand typically goes down for certain product, goods and services. And the opposite is also true. When lower interest rates, demand typically goes up. So that's the kind of thing we're going to talk about uh, well, this, in this chapter. The interest rate, the central bank impacts especially when they make decisions on interest rates. Talk about uh, the two-way effect of aggregate demand and the shifts based off of policy. So we just talked about the long-run effects and the short-run effects on aggregate supply and demand in the previous chapter. And we're going to look a little bit deeper on the impacts of demand based off of policy, based off of interest rates, investment, and economic growth, and those type of things that, that impact uh, demand. And we'll also talk about inflation because it's something that we're dealing with currently here in 2022. When we talked about the aggregate demand, we know that it's downward sloping to the right. And it's because of the wealth effect, interest rate effect, and exchange rate. Now, remember, the wealth effect, that has to do with consumer spending. Consumer spending, that is wealth. Your purchasing power is your wealth. Okay, it's not based off of the amount of money you have sitting in the bank. It's based off of your ability to spend that money. It's wealth. The interest rate is also investing, okay? Investing is what companies do into their business, purchasing property, plant, and equipment in order to grow the business. When we grow the business, we can produce more goods and services. So the interest rate has a direct impact on the businesses. It also has an impact on individuals because when interest rates are high, it makes it difficult to get a loan. When interest rates are low, it's easier to get a loan. Okay. We'll talk about that. And we're also going to look at exchange rates. The exchange rates are directly correlated with exports. The reason for this is because the exchange rates have an impact on the value of the dollar. We talked about that a few chapters ago, right? A few weeks ago. We talked about the value of the dollar. Value goes up, value, uh, there'll be less net exports. Value goes down, there'll be more net exports. So those three things impact the aggregate demand. The monetary and fiscal policies impact the aggregate demand because of the interest rate. As you know, government has a direct impact on the interest. 
That's why it's a very, very important aspect of the aggregate demand. When the interest rates are higher, it typically slows down gross domestic product. When we talk about money supply or money in general, the concept of liquidity is really important. For those of you who took accounting with me, you know that on the balance sheet, you have assets, liabilities, and equity. And on the balance sheet, assets are listed out in the order of liquidity. That's why the first thing you see on the balance sheet is cash. And you see accounts receivable. And then you see inventory. And then you see uh, property plan equipment. Listed out in the order of liquidity. Liquidity means how quickly you can convert an asset into cash to then use that cash. That's liquidity. The reason why I bring this up is because the concept of being liquid has an impact on the interest rate and on investing. So liquidity, think money, money, think interest rate. So the theory of the interest rate is that the interest rate goes up or down to balance out supply and demand for money. Kind of. Mostly, that's mostly true. Interest rate is used to balance out the supply and demand for money. If there are um, not enough people borrowing money, we'll lower the interest rate. If there are too many people borrowing money, we will increase the interest rate. When I lower the interest rate, it increases the demand for money. Because, when, you know, when you borrow... When you borrow money and the interest rates are low, you know, it's it's less expensive uh, because you won't be paying back in, in terms a lot as in terms of interest. So it's more attractive, right? Lower interest rate, that's attractive. The interest rate's low, I won't have to pay as much back over time. Absolutely. That increases demand for borrowing. Decreased demand for borrowing, I raise the interest rate, right? <laughs> Very simple. Nominal interest rates and real interest rates are correlated when it comes to the supply and demand for money. The assumption is that inflation is typically constant. This was true. This used to be true. Inflation was a, con a constant thing in our daily lives. We just never really noticed it because it was so low. You want a little bit of inflation in your economy. You want it to be around 2% per year. That's low, but that's, cons that's constant, that's consistent. And that's what it used to be from 2010 to, to um, 2020. The inflation rate was about 2% sometimes 3%, but usually hovered around 2%. Prices gradually rose just a little bit. You barely noticed it. You go to the grocery store, it changed by a penny. You don't notice a penny. You'll notice 50 cents, but you won't notice a penny. So inflation rates were typically consistent. That was always the assumption. Money supply, it was typically always fixed by the central bank. The central bank put money into the system and took money out of the system. That's the physical flow of money. Yeah, that's true. And that was irrelevant of the interest rate. So money supply, central bank. Okay. Yeah, they supplied the money to the other banks. And then you would go to your local bank and do things with money there. That was the whole concept behind the money supply. The money demand, however, was 
based on is based on individual's ability to attain cash and use that cash for household things. Here's what I mean by this. I'm going to break this down as much as I can. The money demand reflects the wealth that people want to hold in liquid form. Money demand simply means how much money you got in the bank. Your bank account. How much you got. That is the money demand. How much you want to have in that bank account. That's the money demand. Households two types of assets. One is the actual cash you have in the bank in your house. The other one is called bonds. And bonds. It's somewhat true. Money is liquid. Okay? The cash in your savings account and in your checking account it's liquid. I can pull it out and use it right away. There's usually little to no interest involved there. A bond is similar to a loan. There's interest involved there. The bond, it's a, that's your mortgage. Your mortgage is a type of bond. Yeah. So, two types of assets here. Yeah. House itself is backed by a mortgage, a bond, the cash you have in the bank. Those are the two types of assets that households typically have, and that makes up the household wealth. Your demand for money is based on your preference for liquidity. That's what we mean by this. Let's say you want to do, uh, you want to remodel your bathroom. Okay, and you don't have enough cash on hand in your bank account to do that with. So what do you do? You take out a loan. Okay, to get the additional money that you need to remodel your bathroom. The cash you have plus the loan that you want to take out to remodel your bathroom represents the money demanded. variables that influence the money demand. Y, which is real income. Y is your income. R, that's interest rate. And peak purchasing power. So why? Households want to buy more goods and services, so they need more money. <laughs> wow, that's very straightforward. Yeah, that's true. Households want to buy more goods and services because so they need more money. You want more stuff, you need more money for that stuff. Get the money. You might take out a loan. They attempt to sell some of their bonds. Take out a loan. This causes an increase in the money demand. Money supply is vertical. Remember, the money supply is a fixed amount because of the central bank, the Federal Reserve. Changes in the interest rate do not affect the money supplied in the system. The money demand, however, is directly correlated with the interest rate. When there's a decrease in the interest rate, there's an increase in the money demand. Lower interest rate, the more I can borrow.
there's a decrease in the purchasing power. There's a decrease in the interest rate. There's a decrease in the money supply. There's a decrease in the interest rate. There's a decrease in price. Or decrease in the demand. Federal Reserve uses monetary policy in order to influence the amount of money being demanded. The policy instrument. We look at the monetary supply and the interest rate, which is also known as the federal funds rate. To operationalize monetary supply. What I mean by that is that the Federal Reserve influences the money supply based off of the federal funds rate that ultimately operationalizes the money supply. So Interest rate and the money being supplied, yeah, there's a correlation. Interest rate, lower money supply, money, money demand, money supply, if the money supply decreases, there's going to be an increase in the interest rate. Very simply put, the higher the interest rate, the lower the supply of money. Remember, you're not going to want as much money at a higher interest rate. Increasing the interest rate reduces the quantity of goods and services demanded. If it's more expensive to buy, to take out a loan, you're not going to want to, to buy as much stuff. It's very easy. Here's the thing. It's, a, it's like a cycle, yeah? Interest rate goes up and down. Interest rate goes down. You want to borrow more money so you can buy more goods and services. Interest rate goes up. You're going to borrow less money and you're going to want less goods and services. Yeah. Here's the thing. It's tied to what we call the liquidity trap. You're caught between this <laughs> cycle. Interest rate goes up. I want less. Interest rate goes down. I want more. Up and down, up and down. You get stuck in what's called a liquidity trap. If the interest rates are really low, on zero, monetary policy may no longer be effective, and the nominal interest rate can no longer be reduced. Average demand, production, and unemployment may be trapped at low levels. This situation is bad. Two types of monetary trap. One's between interest rate fluctuations and you're stuck between more goods or less goods. It's a different kind of trap. This liquidity trap, the one I just described, that's Europe right now. Okay, Europe's been stuck in this liquidity trap for like 15 years now. Monetary policy is not effective anymore because the interest rates in Europe have been around zero. It deflates. It deflates the economy. So the European economy has been deflated for a long time. They've been stuck because interest rates have been around zero for a long time. And monetary supply is no longer effective because of that. You can't go less than zero. You can. Actually, Germany did that. They went below zero for a little bit and that caused havoc. They fixed that. The central bank uh, has tools that they use in order to combat inflation. As you know, the interest rates go up to combat high inflation rates. They go low to keep inflation rates in check. Currently, 
in 2022, inflation rate is high, so therefore the interest rate is high. The Federal Reserve has increased the uh, interest rate four times throughout the, this year so far, and each time they've increased it has been between a half a percentage point and three-fourths of a percentage point. This year alone, the Federal Reserve has increased the interest rate by uh, almost 3%. Which is a lot, by the way, in a very short amount of time. It's to combat the rate of inflation. We hope it'll work. Uh, we call we so that's what we call forward guidance. Quantitative easing. The government, uh, the U.S. government, tried this from 2008 to 2020. What they did is that uh, in order to keep interest rates low and a good supply of money going into the banks and all that jazz, what the government did is they actually purchased securities uh, such as mortgages, corporate debt, and other long-term government bonds. And the reason why the government purchased those things was to, um, well, the reason why they started doing that was originally was to combat the deep recession that we were in in 2008. And, and so that's called quantitative easing when the government uh, purchases uh, mortgage-backed securities. And uh, throughout the past few years, the government has been selling those uh, mortgage-backed securities in order to correct their balance sheet. We'll talk a little bit about that. So fiscal policy is set by the government uh, based off of spending and taxation. Of course, here in the United States, our wonderful people in Congress set uh, spending and taxation. Governments can either grow or shrink based off of taxes. When there's an increase in taxes, that means the government is collecting more in revenue. There's a decrease in taxes. That means the government is collecting less in revenue. Government grows when they collect more taxes. Government shrinks when they collect less taxes. Very straightforward. So fiscal policy has two effects on the aggregate demand, and those two effects are taxation and government spending. If the government, and here's an example of, of the monetary, uh, I'm sorry, uh, sorry, 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 went a little too fast there. Here's, a, um, here's an example of fiscal policy. So the government does some spending. They decide to buy a couple of airplanes from Boeing, uh, totaling uh, $20 billion. That's a lot. So uh, what happens at, on Boeing? Well, of course, their profits go up, they pay stock dividends, their revenues are really high, they employ more people, good things, good things for Boeing. Uh, they're also consumers, so they'll spend more money with the extra income, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we can see that when the government purchases things, there's a multiplier effect. Government puts an order in for a large contract. To fulfill the contract, the company needs to hire more people. That's a good thing because those people will be paid an income. And that's a good thing because they'll spend that new income on goods and services. So we see that there's a multiplier effect. When it spends money, on a government contract. The people working in that company that has the government contract employs more people. Those people are paid salaries. They spend those salaries in the local economy. We call that the multiplier effect. How big does the multiplier effect get? It depends. 
It depends. It depends on the amount of money that the government spent. Marginal propensity to consume is uh, how the multiplier effect works, and this well, marginal propensity. Propen I can never say that word right. Propensity to consume comes from a change in consumer spending divided by a change in gross domestic product. It's a representation of fractional income that comes from a high, higher wage, and then they go out and spend more. Very simple. The multiplier effect a relatively complex formula, but I'll break it down for you. Delta sign, that's the triangle. The delta, that means change. Delta, the triangle, that means change. Change from year to year. Okay. The formula follows the same formula as gross domestic product. Gross domestic product equals consumer spending plus investment plus government spending plus net exports. Change in gross domestic product comes from the change in consumer spending plus the change in government spending. The change in gross domestic product comes from the multiplier effect, which is the change in gross domestic product plus the change in government spending. Change in gross domestic product can be represented by the multiplier effect as one divided by one minus the MPC. I'm not going to try to pronounce that word again. <laughs> times gross domestic times the change in government spending. Yes, it's a very complex formula. And no, I will not be testing you on that on the final exam. Don't worry about that. The size and the multiplier effect depends on the multiplier itself. Of course, 2, 4, 10 is represented by uh, the multi at the MP MPC. MPC. I was going to call it MPC. It's a multiplier effect, the uh, perpetual propensity. I don't know. I can't pronounce that word. A bigger MPC means changes in gross domestic product because of changes in consumer spending, which is in turn a cause of bigger changes in gross domestic product based off of the multiplier effect. The multiplier effect can be described as well, a dollar change in government spending generates a dollar change in aggregate demand. This is also true for other components of gross domestic product. That's what we'll talk about <laughs> for, for that part. Okay, It's a complex formula. Don't worry too much about it. The multiplier effect basic way to understand it is that um, as the government spends more, that will cause the company that it's spending with to spend more on wages and other investments, which in turn causes additional investment in the local economy. So that's what we call the multiplier effect. And what I just showed you that with that formula, that's how we would measure the multiplier effect. Don't worry, again, too much about that. I'm not going to test you on that. Uh, crowding out effect. This is where there's an offset in the aggregate demand, and it's based off of expansion efforts made by the federal government through increasing interest rates, which reduces investment spending because, again, when interest rates are high, people will spend less, they'll invest less. This reduces net uh, uh, reduces any net increase in aggregate demand 
and therefore there will be a shift to the left in aggregate demand. Higher interest rates will reduce the aggregate demand. When there are changes in taxes, if taxes go down, that means you have more money in your pocket. You'll use that more money by spending it. That will cause a shift in the aggregate demand to the right. The size of the shift, of course, it depends on the multiplier effect and crowding out effect. If it's a permanent tax cut, that's a larger long-term impact on aggregate demand. If it's a temporary tax cut, meaning the tax holiday, uh, something short-term, will be a small impact on aggregate demand. The government tries to help, I think. And what they do is they try to stabilize aggregate demand and supply. And the way that they do that, of course, is to, by impacting interest rates and impacting the supply of cash. Uh, stabilization is usually a good thing. But there, of course, there are other causes for fluctuations in the economy, such as increases and decreases uh, in economies around the world and changes in the stock market. Policymakers do nothing. The fluctuations will be destabilizing to businesses and will ultimately cause issues for workers and consumers. Some people are for government policy and some are against it. That's the way it's always been, right? When GDP goes down, we want the government to do something about it. To reduce the possibility of an infl of a recession. So what do they do? They'll lower interest rates, they'll try to stabilize things that way. When GDP is rising above its natural late, uh, natural rate, what does the government do? They'll increase interest rates. Because there's a lag in policy, uh, there's typically a way that they try to stabilize things is through additional policy to stabilize things in the long term uh, growth and the low inflation. That's what they try to do. some automatic stabilizers to stabilize the economy and it's through uh, stimulus when there's a recession and we've seen that uh, in 2008 they sent out stimulus checks we also saw that at the beginning of the pandemic uh, in 2020 with stimulus checks um, that was meant to be on automatic stabilizers to prevent a recession but uh, and then up being the opposite. But you know, then again, I don't think anyone saw that. When taxes go down, it stimulates the economy. Taxes go up, it does the opposite. In recessions, typically the government tries to re temporarily reduce taxes, uh, which will help to stimulate the economy. Congress cuts taxes, hopefully it'll stimulate the economy, reduce uh, possibility of unemployment, et cetera. And it usually has an impact on savings and growth in the long term. If the Federal Reserve reduces the rate of money growth, uh, it will affect inflation, we think. Comments, questions, concerns? Monetary yeah. supply, fiscal supply, policy, aggregate demand, no? None? No, it's very much understandable. We've been talking about this stuff, Miss Anthony. Yeah, for, for a long, long time. <laughs> How long now? 14 weeks? Oh, my goodness. 
I think you all are supply and demand to doubt. <laughs> I did. Yeah, I was. Uh, I was listening to your class. Well, I'm sorry, Cornelia. What was that? I'm here. I'm present. So I I'm was so happy to your you're class. here. I'm happy you're here. <laughs> yes. Did you like the talk on supply and demand? Get a, get a... Uh, the charter was so okay because um, we asked some examples how we can like I uh, have an idea how to do the assignment. So I don't worry too much for that. So <laughs> yeah, very good, very good. I'm yes. glad okay. You're... Thank you. You're very welcome. Oh, good. Very good. Okay. Um. So just kind of recap where we are uh, in the classroom. Just wanted to touch bases with you all. We are currently in week 14, if you believe that or not. Um, time goes by so fast, doesn't it? We got a chapter 20 quiz, chapter 21 quiz, both are on aggregate supply and demand. Uh, just to, to, they just like they, like they all are, two attempts, uh, multiple choice, true, false, uh, two attempts, all that good stuff. Uh, they're both due on Sunday night. So next week uh, will be our final lecture. Next week we will talk about chapters uh, 22 and 23. Uh, and then the, that following week is da, 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 the final exam. Okay, I, yeah, I know. It, it came, came kind of quick, I think. Um, and we're already toward the end of November, if you believe that or not. So, uh, Any comments, questions, concerns? Uh, okay. All right. Well, make sure you get to that chapter 20 and 21 quizzes uh, submitted by Sunday night. Uh, happy Thanksgiving. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Uh, it's uh, Thursday. So, yeah, enjoy your Thanksgiving. Spend some time with your friends and family and, and whoever. Try to enjoy uh, a little bit of turkey, not too much turkey. <laughs> Makes you sleepy, doesn't it? Um, yeah, just... You know, enjoy yourselves. You know, it's, it's you. You've earned it. You've all been working very hard in this class, and I sincerely appreciate all of your efforts. Uh, you know, if you ever need any help, you can always email me, call me, set up office hours. Uh, I'm always here for you. And remember, stay safe. Wash your hands, especially around the holidays. Okay, I don't want you getting sick. Stay safe. Wash your hands. Do the right things. And uh, I'll see you all again on Monday for our last uh, session. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate all of you. Have a wonderful night. Thank you. You do the same, Professor. Have a happy Thank Thanksgiving. Thank you, you too. Happy Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving.